and we ask God to guide our study of his word today as we, I think, will conclude Matthew 5 um, in a couple of brief sections. We begin um, with Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament um, uh, in verses 17 and following, and that will bring us to the crazy alphabet that my grandmother would have called chicken scratches that are before you, but let's uh, read the verse first. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. Amen, I tell you. Until heaven and earth pass away, not even the smallest letter or even part of a letter will in any way pass away from the law until everything is fulfilled. So you might remember that as jot or tittle or smallest letter or how did the NIV say it, the least stroke of a pen, something along those lines. Here, here you have the smallest letter in Hebrew, which is yod. Um, actually, in the more ancient alphabet that Moses used, which is not the one that's in front of you, um, the next letter over, Vav, would have been the smallest letter. Yod was quite a bit larger and written in a, like, like a crazy Z um, in, in, the, in the ancient Phoenician alphabet. But a small stroke of a pen, you can imagine how small this would be. We would probably talk about it in terms of um, oh, like if you look at, at the handout I've given you, at the word Matthew at the top, do you see how there are little strokes at the top of each line and bottom of each line? Those are called serifs. They're not required when you're writing you know, a letter of the alphabet, but they actually make the letter a little bit easier to recognize um, for, for whatever. I don't know who came up with the idea of serifs, um, but, but they're there. But I would like to teach you the Hebrew alphabet just so that you've done it once. And we're going to sing the song, okay? So you see all the letters written out there, and we're, we're not going to read right to left or left to right or anything. We're going to read top to bottom, and we are going left to right. So we're starting over on the left side of the page. Under smallest letter, it says Aleph. And then there is the letter Aleph, which looks kind of like a fat X. Okay? And uh, we're going to sing them. Are you ready? You got your, you got your, um, your uh, alphabet song in your head? So we're going to sing it to the tune of A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay? All right? We'll do it kind of slow. But read the letters with me. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samik, Ayin, Pe, Tzade, Kof, Resh, Sin, Shin, Tav. Very good. Now you've sung the Hebrew alphabet. And... If I had a whiteboard in here, which I don't today, and that's okay, uh, I, I could write all of your names in Hebrew and do all kinds of things. And the, the easiest way to learn the Hebrew alphabet is to go into the genealogies of the Old Testament after learning the, the consonants and then figuring out what the names are because proper names don't require any translating, right? A proper name is a proper name is a proper name. So you can read, if you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 1, you can read the first verse and realize, oh, it says Adam, Seth, Enosh. That's verse 1. That's 1 Chronicles 1.1. 1, 1. And you can see, oh, that's what the letters say and go on from there. And then after a while, you'll learn that the letter Vav in the second column at the top is also the Hebrew word for and. And the whole new world opens up then and you, re, you know, realize various things and so forth. But you see though on our, on our list that Yod in about two-thirds of the way down in the second column is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet and that's what's on the screen. So little tiny letter, doesn't matter how significant or insignificant. Incidentally, Yod is also what I would call a vowel letter. 
and therefore not even required. Um, when David would spell his name, he probably didn't even use what we would think of as the I. Um, David generally is spelled um, Dalit Vav Dalit in the Old Testament. Very rarely is the Hirek there with a, with a consonant. So uh, is it David or is it the other way? Because you would, the, the, the V can also be an U sound. Therefore, King David's name could really be a cool 1960s word. Dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that might also be how you pronounce it. So, um, but David. Um, so, I, I, so I, just keeping in mind what Jesus has said here, that he's not here to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Um, I think of this in terms of a race. Jesus is the captain of our team. Um, and he's the only one to qualify for the race on either side. So he runs the race. And he doesn't cancel the race or abolish it. He simply is the only one to run it and he finishes it alone. So he's the one who was our champion and won the race for us. Okay. Verse 19. Or any questions on the Hebrew language now that I've taught you the whole thing? No, okay. Uh, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So we have four things here to, to, to consider. Um, breaking a commandment, even the least one, is a sin, isn't it? What would you call teaching others to do the same? False doctrine, at the very least. Um, a nasty thing to do would be to uh, teach others to do the same. And then whoever practices these things, I would call Christian living. And then whoever teaches those things, which is correct doctrine. So we want to avoid breaking or, and certainly teaching others to break, but we want to practice them and teach others to practice them. The problem, of course, is uh, I often break them. And therefore, when I teach them, you know, can I sound like a hypocrite? I might. Um, and, and so there is a, uh, a little balancing act you, uh, you, you run there. We're taught at the seminary, don't confess your private sins in the pulpit. Why is that a good idea? Not to do that. Yeah, the congregation doesn't need to know. You know, If I have some big gambling hang-up or something, would the congregation want to know about it? Well, the council maybe should know about it. And especially if I have anything to do with the money. You know, but I also think it's a, unwise to get the pastor to have any... By the way, I don't have a gambling problem. I just want you to know that. <laughs> but, um, but, um, you know, the, but the minister, for that reason, shouldn't be anywhere near the money, you know, if possible. It's hard enough um, when, anybody with, 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 when anybody handles money, in my opinion. It's challenging. It's, in fact... And in, in, in our congregational constitutions, there really is only one rule about the makeup of the church council when it comes down to it, um, as far as the number of men who can serve and so forth. Because you can have a church council for a congregation of 2,000 people with only three guys on it. If there are only three guys who are qualified, then they can run it. But the same guy cannot be the treasurer and the person who writes all the checks. That's, that's a conflict of interest, yeah. Nor should those two people be married, you know, to each other. Thank you, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, oh, let's get to verse 20 and the juicy stuff. Indeed, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the experts in the law, 
you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. How many Jewish sects were there in Jesus' time? I have a hint for you by having them printed in bold at the top, middle, and bottom of this page and the top of the next page. I think that they were six. Um, so, first of all, you have what I will call mainstream Judaism. And I'm always surprised when, uh, when, when we talk about the various branches of Judaism and we don't talk about the vast majority of Jews who were, would simply have called themselves Jews. Um, they're the ones who went to synagogue every Saturday or every Friday night and um, had their kids or their sons circumcised and they had their kids taught their alphabets and their olive baits and, uh, and learned their numbers from the scribes and so forth. And they, you know, went about their lives and they, they painted their houses and herded their goats and sold their wares and tilled their fields and that's what they did. But then there were these other groups like, first of all, the Pharisees and so forth. Almost all of the other groups have their roots in the Maccabean revolt of the 200s. So in, the, in, the, in, in between the Testaments after Malachi, about exactly halfway in between Malachi and Matthew, um, a crazy man became the Persian king who was, uh, or rather, I'm sorry, the, 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 the Greek heritage king who was taking over the, um, the, the possession of Syria and Israel because before his time, Alexander the Great had swept through um, and Alexander had left his four, Alexander died pretty young. Maybe you remember how, was he 32 or something or 31? Um, died of that classic military disease um, I believe, dysentery, and, uh, and left his four generals in charge. Two of them don't interest us too much because one of them was in charge of India and one, one was in charge of Greece, but the two who were in charge of Syria and Africa, um, Seleucus up north and, um, and uh, 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 Ptolemy in the south, uh, began to fight over the, 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 the gemstone, which was apparently Israel. Um, they fought back and forth, and it went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And a, a, a descendant of the Seleucid line named Antiochus um, called himself uh, Epiphanes, which means the glorious or the revealed. And the Jews who were under him started calling him Epimenes, which means crazy man. Um, and he was eventually murdered, but he did terrible things, setting up uh, statues to Zeus in the temple and abolishing the, the, the Israelite um, priesthood and high priesthood. He set up his own priests and so forth. He was just a wretch. Um, and, uh, and at that time, different people had different ideas about how to resist him. I believe that the Pharisees and the Zealots came directly out of the Maccabees, or we would call them the Hasmoneans. Um, the, the Pharisees accepted the whole Old Testament as scripture, but they began to make up extra rules, um, things that are not scriptural, just to keep people from breaking the rules. So where God says, you shall not misuse my name, the Pharisees went a step further and said, you know what, unless you're really trained, maybe you shouldn't use God's name at all. Is that what God meant? No, he wanted us to use his name for the correct reasons. But the Pharisees stopped using it altogether. Um, when my wife was a college student at the UW-Madison uh, for a while, um, she was a ten-fingered typist, you know, which is a rare thing. And she would type papers for her classmates for money. And one of her classmates was Jewish. And... Uh, Kath was trying to read her manuscript and noticed that she kept spelling God, G-D, -D, and Kath, being a good Wells girl, respelled it, G-O-D, and the girl, in horror, made her retype the paper with a dash where the O was. And this, of course, is in pre-computer times when she had to retype the whole paper um, and, and everything. And remember when you had to 
click the typewriter up one click to type a footnote number and all that stuff and the joys of figuring out how many lines your footnote would take at the bottom of the page to leave that much space and all the headache of that. Um, uh, uh, um, what was the other part of that? Oh, uh, there, was a, 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 there was a famous author uh, who worked um, on some Star Trek episodes in the 60s. And his, his shock was when he found out that IBM used a different pitch, that is, we would call it a font size, than all other typewriters. And he had typed his in 12, and it was supposed to be in 10. And in those days, the smaller number was the bigger, not the way it is now. And so his, his perfect manuscript for this Star Trek episode was 20% too long. You know, it would be like an hour and 10 minutes instead of 55 minutes, and he had to edit it down. But... Uh, so, David Gerald, the author of The Trouble with Tribbles. There. There. I learned that for a reason as a kid. Let's just go on. So, yeah, Pharisees and teach. The Pharisees were the ones who seemed to be the ones who did everything right on the outside, but it wasn't all that right. Um, I was talking to the kids at MVL the other day, and I, and I, 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 was, I, I did a first-person sermon where I was one of the apostles and talked about this new fad I've discovered while visiting you here, which is the chili dog. And I learned to love chili dogs. I'm one of the apostles saying this. And I bit into one and something was wrong. And it, the bun was fine, the cheese was fine, the chili sauce was fine, the hot dog was grilled on the outside, but it was raw inside. You know, there's something wrong with that, right? And that's how God strips away our sinfulness. Nothing wrong with this. This looks good on the outside. This looks great on the outside. But there's something wrong on the inside where our sinfulness is. Um, and uh, let's move on. That's the Pharisees. The Sadducees, um, Pastor Sutton used to say that they are sad, you see. Um, Sadducees accepted Moses as the Old Testament, as Scripture. And the other things of the, Old, the Psalms and the Prophets they would have accepted as maybe secondary at best, but maybe not even. Kind of the way you and I would treat the Apocrypha. Like, well, you could read it, and there are some things that are in it that are pretty good. And by the way, can I just say, I've said this before, I would much rather have you reading the Apocrypha than watching soap operas and stuff. You know, there are some wonderful things in the Apocrypha. Um, and you're, you're a mature enough Christian, each one of you, that you would see what's wrong, the couple things that are wrong in the Apocrypha with no, no problem at all. But some of the books, the Wisdom of Solomon is marvelous, just delightful. A lot of what's in uh, Ecclesiasticus or Sirach is, is, is wonderful there. The Song of the Three Children is a delight. It used to be in the old, old hymnal, the 1941 hymnal. Did you know that the Song of the Three Children, an apocryphal book, was the first of the canticles? in that old hymnal. Did you know that, TJ? Yeah. I mean, it's there. It's printed right there. The Song of the Three Children, first of the canticles. But uh, Marvelous, marvelous stuff. Delightful. I often go into the Apocrypha myself for help with Greek because sometimes there's a word. The Apocrypha was largely written in Greek and um, uh, sometimes there's a word that doesn't get used in the New Testament very often, but there it is in the Apocrypha and there's a little bit of vocabulary help that way. Um, so, the, but getting back to the Sadducees, they also rejected the ideas of angels, demons, heaven, hell, the resurrection of any kind. That's the Sadducees. What kind of a religion is it that rejects any afterlife at all? Why bother? Um, unless you think that God looks out for us in this lifetime like a benevolent owner of a dog who blesses you over other dogs, you know, if you're good enough, that's essentially the theology of the Pharisee. I'm a dog with a better owner than you. You know, but the, the lifetime is still so brief and everything. Then there were the Essenes. The Ess Have you, anybody heard of the Essenes before? They were kind of the monks. If you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes are the ones who probably lived in those caves or nearby, and they were monastics. They may have taken care of manu manuscripts. The Dead Sea Scrolls might have just been their, either their library or I sometimes wonder if it was their junk library. 
that the Jews who lived near a synagogue could take their old copies of their Bibles and hymnals and stuff. And the way that today people bring me their old German Bibles, which I don't want, really don't, but they bring them to me saying, Pastor, can you use this for something? What, in my German 404 class? I don't know what I would use this for. I don't even know German. You know, but okay, I'll, but what do I do? I say thank you and I take it because it has Aunt Marilee's name embossed on the cover and, and whatever. Anybody else have an Aunt Marilee or is it just me? Okay. And uh, they, but uh, they, what, the, what the Jews used to do is they would take a brick out of the wall of the synagogue and they would put these old manuscripts in the synagogue to give them like a peaceful rest. Well, the Essenes didn't have a synagogue. So what did they do? I think they stuck their old manuscripts in jars and put them in caves. Um, that it's also possible that they did that because the Romans were coming and they wanted to hide some of their manuscripts. But most of it is just garbage. It's not full scrolls. And it, you know, some of them are preserved and they're pretty good. But you know, there's a good copy of Isaiah that I've seen in person. Good copies of Deuteronomy and the Psalms, but not much else. Yes. I never have. I I I have gobs of them in my office that I I don't know what to do. Um, you know I um there there would be nothing wrong. Um, I, finally, probably, with if a Bible was like damaged by mold or water or something, um, it's not going to be useful to anybody. What would be the best way to take care of it? It might be with reverence and with dignity, burn the thing. You know, I'm, I, I don't think I'd want to recycle it because you, you never know if they're going to accept it as recycling or not. So if you put something in the recycling, it may yet land in the landfill. So I think burning would be the, the, the proper thing to do, especially if you can do it legally, which I think in New Elm means not in town. I don't want to judge anybody Saturday afternoon, but I think we're not supposed to burn in town. Um, and so you might have to find a friend who has a farm or something like that. And, and like I said, with respect, maybe even with the Lord's Prayer, you know, you know, uh, uh, Lord, these are no longer useful and maybe, maybe they should be uh, returned ashes to dust and so forth. Yeah, that's, if that, if that offends somebody, I apologize, but I don't know of anything better to do. Um, and so far I haven't brought myself to do it and I have a lot of things people have given me over the years. Yeah, boxes of them in my garage at home, honestly. You know. Most of those now, because they're in my garage, are water damaged. So it's probably time to, time to say goodbye. A bunch of 1984 NIVs and things like that. Um, okay. The Zealots. Uh, oh, by the way, the Essenes disappeared. Um, completely vanished by about the year 100. They're just gone. And I think one of the problems was they didn't practice marriage. You know, so there weren't a lot of women there. And the, one, the women who were there, I think, were also maybe celibate. So your, 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 your cult is not going to last long if you're not having babies. Um, say that again? Some shakers have children. Yeah, Nixon did. No, Nixon was a shaker. No, he's a shaker. Let's stop this argument. But anyway... <laughs> That's what I learned in school, was that Nixon was a shaker. Yeah, yeah. Um, the zealots uh, were more militaristic. Who's the most famous zealot in the Bible? Simon, one of the apostles. Um, I, 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 they, uh, almost all the zealots who did not become Christians died at Masada in 73. Um, the Romans were trying to... Uh, Masada is a gigantic, uh, huge... Uh, fortressy mountain uh, near the Dead Sea. And I don't know how many of us were around in whatever year that was. There was a famous TV movie called Masada. It's a national park. 
back in the, back in the 70s where they depicted what happened. But the Zealots um, uh, committed suicide um, as a group in, at, the, at the end of that siege. When the Romans finally got up there, there weren't any alive. So, um, uh, with regard to some of their teachings, the zealots in many ways resembled modern Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm not going to get into their teachings right now. But I'm not going to get into their teachings right now, but yeah, they did. Yeah, theologically. Yeah. And then, the, uh, and then finally, the Christians. Um, I want to... Um, just point out that all through this chapter, uh, Jesus is not giving any new laws. As we continue here, he's not giving new interpretations on the laws. Jesus, for the most part, is simply restating what you can find already there in, in, in the prophets and in the Psalms, especially Isaiah and Jeremiah. Jesus will simply repeat something that's there in, in the Old Testament about um, lust or adultery or divorce or taking an oath. That's the rest of the chapter, or anger. Um, he's not giving new laws, although there are those today who think that Jesus was a new lawgiver, but he's not. Um, he's taking the regular, easily understood and prevalent applications of Moses that are there in the prophets and showing how the Pharisees especially were incorrect in their bizarre applications of the law. Um, I'll point out one or two of those as we're going along, okay? You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.